What will happen to your health and your weight if you have a can of diet soda every single day? Diet soda's worse? Ironically, it's worse. Come on, how so? Well, many of us turn to diet sodas. The problem is, look at the sweetener they use. It's aspartame, ACE K, and sucralose. And these are the bad artificial sweeteners that are man-made. Here's why diet soda is even worse for you than regular soda is. They actually did a study on diet sodas versus normal sodas and found that the people who were drinking diet actually gained more inches on their waist. Despite what this TikTok creators are trying to get you to believe with all their fear mongering, the truth is that if you have a daily can of diet soda, nothing bad is going to happen to you. And it's possible it can even have a positive effect on your weight loss. Now I'm sure I'm gonna get a lot of heat about this video just making that statement because the topic of diet soda is extremely controversial. But today I'm going to be explaining how diet soda is connected to your weight based on the latest nutrition research. So keep watching. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel and thanks for tuning in into another video. If you're new here, my name is Andres. I'm a registered dietitian who works specifically with parents and professionals who are struggling to lose weight while balancing their busy lifestyle. Mm. On my channel, I really give you a lot of practical science-based advice to simplify your weight loss journey. And along the way, I try to debunk nutrition myths and BS claims that create a lot of confusion around healthy eating and fat loss. And I usually get a lot of heat about that. So make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss any new videos from me. So let's get into today's video. Today, we're talking about diet sodas and its impact specifically on weight loss. Now, to talk about diet sodas, we had to talk about artificial sweeteners, which is gonna be the main topic in today's conversation. So before we jump into the comments and start ripping this apart and talking about things like cancer and gut health, I'm going to to tell you right now that we're not going to get into either of one of those topics. I could make full videos on both of those topics and all the research out there in all of them. But if I try to get into it right now, this video is going to get way too long and it's going to become more of a documentary. So for today, we're just going to focus on claims you might have heard about artificial sweeteners, particularly in diet soda, spiking your insulin levels and causing weight gain. A couple important disclaimers here. One, this video is not sponsored, not I have been paid to promote diet soda or artificial sweeteners. And second, I'm not supporting drinking diet soda over water, for God's sakes. Okay, cool. Now let's get started. Let's start with the basics first, because I think a lot of people talk about artificial sweeteners and don't even know what they are. What are artificial sweeteners? Artificial sweeteners are also known as non-nutritive sweeteners, and they're synthetic sugar substitutes, and they use them to sweeten foods and to sweeten drinks without adding significant calories or affecting your blood sugar levels. Now they're much sweeter than sugar, allowing them to be used in smaller amounts to achieve the desired sweetness and texture. The sweeteners are popular among individuals trying to manage their weight, diabetes, to reduce sugar intake, or to me, I like the taste of them. In the US, there are six approved sweeteners and are considered food additives. This is actually very similar to Europe for those of you that are gonna talk about Europe's ingredients and all that. Number one, we have aspartame. Um, the brand names are Equal and Nutra Sweet and they're commonly used in most of the diet sodas that you know you typically get and other lower calorie products. Second, you have sucralose. Brand name is Splenda. It's heat stable, so they're using it more in baking goods or baked goods and it's about 600 times sweeter than sugar. Then you have saccharin. Uh, brand name Sweet and Low or Nectar Sweet, and it's one of the oldest sweeteners out there, and it's used both in cooking um, and also in table use as well. And then you have Acelsifem K, uh, brand name Sweet One or Sunet, and it's often blended with other sweeteners as it enhances the overall sweetness of certain products. Now, there are two less common ones known as Neotame and Advantame as well that you don't really hear too much about them. Then there are other plant and fruit-based sweeteners that are considered grass or generally recognized as safe, and they include things like Stevia, which is derived from a plant known as stevia rebudiana and it's a plant and it's considered a natural sweetener i say natural in, in quotation marks mostly because it does require processing to really get the actual powder or the actual grain of it and is widely used in beverages and as a table sweetener the brand names include truvia purvia or enlightened and then their second one is going to be extras from monk fruit and the third one is something known as tomatine which again it's like a very like not known sweetener now that we know the differences between them and what they are let's address now the general concerns being raised all across social media these days. One of these claims is that artificial sweeteners will spike your insulin levels. Now let's get a little bit nerdy here. Insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas. The insulinogenic response is what happens when you consume carbohydrates and your blood sugar levels increase as a result. Specialized cells in the pancreas, they continuously monitor your blood sugar levels and once they rise above certain level, insulin gets released. 
Now, insulin then gives a signal to the cells throughout the body to take up glucose from that bloodstream to be used by the cells for energy to reduce the level of sugar that is available in your blood at any given time. This is a normal, healthy process that is needed for our bodies to function. Insulin spikes are not a bad thing, contrary to what many fit influencers want you to believe. We only run into issues when there's an exaggerated or prolonged insulogenic response, which can contribute to insulin resistance. With this condition, cells become less responsive to insulin and it can lead to type to diabetes and other metabolic disorders. Insulin resistance is not just created by food. It can be created by high stress, by poor sleep, by so many different factors. So we cannot just attribute it to one thing. More specifically, we cannot attribute it to artificial sweeteners. That was a lot of science, but what does this have to do with diet sodas, which are also known as artificially sweetened beverages? Well, to explain this argument, I'm going to hand the mic over to a great TikTok creator who made an incredible video on this topic. So here's what Sky Does Fitness had to say. Let's take a look artificially sweetened beverages. So let's start with the lame arguments first. Some people think that drinking a diet soda causes this insulin spike and therefore tricks your brain into thinking that this has calories, even though it has no calories. And so you gain weight from drinking it. You see how that makes no sense? Yeah. The argument that artificial sweeteners trick your brain into thinking diet soda has calories and causes weight gain sounds pretty ridiculous to me, but some people are actually making this claim. This video here, for example. Anything sweet tasting will make your body produce insulin. So you wanna avoid it. We don't do stevia monk fruit, all that stuff. It's a fake signal to your body that you need to produce insulin and insulin's a fat storing hormone. So just avoid those things, okay? Plus they just make you feel shitty. I know this might seem pretty convincing because she's speaking with a lot of confidence here with a pretty good edited video and she's got a scientific paper at the beginning so there must be some evidence for this claim, right? Unfortunately for her, the paper that she is referencing gives us very, very low quality evidence. So I'm gonna point out a few issues in here and then I'm gonna talk about what the better quality evidence says. The first issue with using this study as your main source of evidence is that it's a cross-sectional design. Take a look at this image that shows something we call the hierarchy of evidence evidence in research. The hierarchy of evidence ranks research studies from strongest to weakest. At the top, you're gonna to find systematic reviews and meta analysis, which combine results from multiple studies, so they give us the most reliable, valid scientific evidence. Randomized controlled trials, or RCTs, come next, where participants are randomly assigned to a test in a control group. And if we keep going down the pyramid, we eventually get to the cross-sectional studies, where we're looking at data from a single point in time. Cross-sectional studies aren't the best evidence because they only look at data from one point in time, like just simply taking a snapshot. They can show you if two things are related, but they can't really tell us which one was first or if one thing caused the other. Also, they don't really show how things change over time. So while they're okay for spotting connections, they're not great for figuring out why things actually happen. Typically, cross-sectional studies are foundational to conduct more research based on observations found in them, but they should never be used as an end-all be-all conclusion. Now, the conclusions of this study said that patients who consume artificial sweetener agents had a higher insulin resistance as compared to group B patients who had no artificial sweeteners. But we know nothing else about those patients, their diets and their lifestyle, so we can't really draw any connections between artificial sweeteners and insulin resistance. There are also a number of other issues with this paper that make it unreliable. For example, check out this claim here that says, according to some studies, the prime reason for developing of diabetes is believed to be artificial sweeteners. I mean, this is just simply untrue and no reputable studies are claiming that artificial sweeteners are the prime reason for diabetes. Okay, now I wanna highlight a few studies that actually give us some very high quality evidence on this topic. So going back to the hierarchy of evidence, we're going to look at systemic reviews and made analysis. This 2020 systematic review and made analysis combined the results of 26 different studies and found no differences in glucose and insulin responses after consuming as high as 500 milligrams of aspartame and Diet Coke, which is about six cans per day. So that whole theory of artificial sweeteners leading to insulin spikes and causing fat storage is simply untrue based on the highest quality research that we're seeing in here. Another systematic review and made analysis from 2022 look at the impact of low and no calorie sweetened beverages as a replacement for sugar sweetened and beverages. So basically diet soda is a replacement for regular soda and they specifically measured the effects on body weight and they found that based on this result of 17 randomized controlled trials was that using artificial sweetened beverages as an intentional substitute for, for the sugar sweetened beverages was associated with small improvements in body weight. There was also another randomized controlled trial that found an interesting result when comparing artificial sweetened beverages with water. Basically the study took a group of diet soda drinkers and split them into two groups while they participated in a structured 
structured weight loss program, which means they control their calories and their diets. One group continued to drink diet soda, and the other group stopped drinking diet soda and replaced it with water. At the end of the one year, the group drinking diet soda had lost and maintained significantly more weight than the group who switched over to water. This is not to say that you should be drinking diet soda instead of water. I'm going to reiterate that. Now I'm going to address something here before I get butchered in the comments on this argument, which is industry funded research. A big important compelling argument many people have been making is that research in this specific area among others, is funded by companies that support consumption of the, the same products that they're producing, in this case, diet beverages, like the American Beverage Association. It recently made headlines about funding social media campaigns with influencers, including people like me, dietitians, to support the consumption of diet drinks, when in reality, they were just simply showing the results of studies. I guess I should say here and reiterate that I'm not being paid by anyone to make this video. Now, this is far too complex and not enough time to cover, but I will say this. Not all studies in these reviews are funded by big diet soda. And also, not all industry-funded research is bad research. You need to be able to read the details of a study before you make assumptions, the methodology, the statistical analysis. This is really what's required to really understand whether there's bias in a study. Now, Dr. Stu Phillips wrote a great up article on this topic, and it's on examine.com. I'm gonna link the, the article here in the description box. If you really want to learn and understand industry-funded research from the perspective of a researchers that have been doing this for the past 30 years. But all this science stuff aside, let's bring back the conversation to diet soda and real life application for weight loss. To do that, I think a little case study can really help you give you an idea on how using diet soda as a replacement for sugar and sweetened beverage can actually be helpful for supporting weight loss. Let's say I have a client named Susan and she loves drinking soda and she drinks three cans of Coke every single day for a total of over 400 calories. Now studies have shown that sodas and other sugar sweetened beverages are associated with weight gain and type two diabetes. So we make a plan together to go back on her consumption of these drinks and switch to Diet Coke instead. We can try to work on reaching or helping her reach her goals and reducing her calorie intake. Now Susan cuts out the 400 calories from the three cans of regular Coke and replaces them with three cans of Diet Coke for a grand total of zero calories. Now, by the argument of the insulin spikes, let's say for a moment that there was an insulin spike. What happens when you consume a Diet Coke and has zero calories? Insulin goes, well, there's no calories. I don't really need to be putting the sugar anywhere else. Now, of course, her other eating habits are important to whether she's going to lose weight or not, but cutting 400 calories daily is going to make it a lot easier for her to stay in that calorie deficit and lose weight. So here's the take home message for today. You don't have to be drinking diet soda if you want to lose weight. I'm not encouraging you to start drinking soda or to start drinking diet soda or saying that it needs to be a weight loss tool for you. But if you like them, like I do, I actually prefer Stevia. Um, it's sweetened by Stevia. I just like the taste of it really. But if you really like them like I do and you find that they can satisfy your cravings for the regular sugar sweetened version of soda, there's evidence that it can be extremely helpful for calorie management. This is just simple math. If you're regularly drinking regular soda and adding hundreds of calories to your diet, replacing that with a zero calorie counterpart, it's one of the easiest changes that you can be making. Ben Carpenter, another creator I'm a huge fan of, summarized this in a really clear way. Let's take a look at what he had to say. As far as weight loss habits go, switching this for this is as easy to implement as it will ever fucking get. Reduced calorie intake, similar taste, and no extra cost, effort, or deprivation to the client. Name anything else that ticks all those boxes. That's a real mic drop moment, honestly, and I'm going to end this video right here for today. As I mentioned in the beginning, there are some topics that I chose to leave out in today's video to keep this focus on the topic of weight loss. But if you wanna learn more about the research on diet soda, or you have any questions, just drop a comment below, and I'll definitely create another video on this. Thanks a lot for tuning in today. I'll see you back here in the next week's video.